An occasional shot in the arm has long been a rite of passage for American children. And for years, few parents questioned the safety of childhood vaccinations. Now a growing number are, and they've triggered a sometimes heart-wrenching debate. Our cover story is reported by Martha Teichner. Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> Eleanor and Mark Tremblay have trouble looking at their son Oliver, eight years old, severely autistic, without saying to themselves, if only. Now he's had that drum all of two minutes or something. He has already learned how to play it. As they play the videos showing how Ali was before, they think, if only they could just rewind their lives. After the, the vaccination, he couldn't even hold the drumstick? No. Yeah. If only they could skip that shot. The measles, mumps, and rubella vaccination they believe caused their son's autism, although there is no conclusive scientific evidence. The vaccination was given at 14 months of age, roughly, and uh, within a, a week or two of that, um, he was not greeting me at the door anymore, didn't want to play ball, was starting to get repetitive um, motions, hand flapping. And he just wasn't there anymore. It's like somebody came and stole them in the night. There is risk with vaccines, but the, the benefits far, far outweigh the risks. Dr. James Dale, a professor of medicine at the University of Tennessee's Health Science Center in Memphis, has spent his entire career, more than 30 years, working to perfect a vaccine to prevent streptococcus, the infection that causes strep throat, and in its more virulent forms, so-called flesh-eating disease and rheumatic fever. If we can reduce the incidence of acute rheumatic fever and rheumatic heart disease by half, in the, in the world, that's where the real uh, personal payoff would come. Dr. James Dale, determined to save millions of children, and the Tremblays, heartbroken over the fate of one boy. Between them, you have the story of vaccines, the greater good versus the risk, no matter how small to the individual. It's a debate that began in this country nearly 300 years ago over smallpox. Well, it was a disease that would sweep through cities and uh, infect, you know, tens of thousands of people at a time, and it would kill 20, 30, 50 percent of them. Journalist Arthur Allen is the author of Vaccine, the controversial story of medicine's greatest lifesaver. Really, the first form of smallpox vaccine came from China and India, where it was used for centuries, and it entered the United States in 1721. Cotton Mather actually brought it to the United States. Yes, Cotton Mather, the hellfire and brimstone Puritan preacher for Boston. His house was firebombed when he urged Bostonians to try scratching live smallpox infection into their skin. In 1796, British country doctor Edward Jenner confirmed that milkmaids exposed to a much milder cowpox virus were immune to smallpox. Millions of people finally dared to be vaccinated with Jenner's cowpox serum. The term vaccinate comes from the Latin word for cow, vaca. Confidence in vaccines and mistrust in vaccines goes in waves. And also, another element is really the seriousness of the disease. I mean, when, pol when the polio vaccine came out in 1955, it came into a country that was petrified of polio. In post-war America, the wail of ambulance sirens, the sight of feverish little faces and bodies immobilized by pain and paralysis becomes an all-too-familiar picture. This CBS documentary captures the hysteria in this period, the three-year statistics run 50,000 polio cases, 103,000 cases, 122,000 cases. Where will it end? The conquest of polio became a national crusade. Millions of Americans participated in the March of Dimes. They literally sent their dimes to the White House and eventually to this National Foundation for Infantile Paralysis. In 1955, the announcement was made that Jonas Salk's polio vaccine worked. The fact that 200 people were paralyzed after getting the shot and 10 died was overlooked. 
I mean, Jonas Salk, um, you know, was a god. I mean, church bells were ringing around the country. I mean, people were embracing in the street. I mean, it was literally, you know, a moment of great unmitigated jubilation around the country. No HPV vaccine! No HPV vaccine! Now they're protesting. This was a rally in Washington last month against the new human papillomavirus vaccine to prevent cervical cancer, the current focus of a growing anti-vaccine backlash. What happened? We have one of the most highly vaccinated child populations in the world. And yet we have children who are increasingly chronically ill and disabled. One in 150 children in America is autistic. One in six is learning disabled. Barbara Lowe Fisher, founder of the National Vaccine Information Center and author of A Shot in the Dark, is one of the many Americans who think there's a connection, even though the medical establishment says no. What we have to do is not discount the reports by parents that they are taking healthy, bright children into their pediatricians to be vaccinated with now by age six, 48 doses of 14 vaccines that the government recommends. And many of them are taking home children that then they watch regress. Fisher says her son Christopher suffered brain damage within hours of getting his fourth DPT, diphtheria, pertussis, and tetanus vaccination. Thanks in large part to her pressure, the manufacturer of the DPT vaccine made it safer, and Congress was forced to pass the National Childhood Vaccine Injury Act, which included money for compensation, proof to Fisher that parents should be wary. The idea that um, some can be sacrificed in service to the rest is very dangerous. Nobody actually knows how many vaccine injuries occur. 17,000 were voluntarily reported in the United States last year. The true number is believed to be much higher. But how to weigh that against the benefit of vaccination? So we forget about the paralysis that plagued our towns years ago. We forget that our mothers said, don't go to the pool for more than two hours because you'll get polio. We forget about what measles has done. We forget that children in Africa die of diarrhea and pneumonia. Dr. John Andrus has spent nearly 15 years running immunization programs around the globe for the World Health Organization. One of his proudest moments, his involvement in India's polio eradication campaign. 125 million children were vaccinated in one day. And we live in a global community. We, we would not want our children left unprotected as long as virus is circulating throughout the world. Polio is a very good example. The last three outbreaks of polio in the United States were all due to importations. Are you categorically opposed to all vaccination now? No, no not at all. No. no. That's even though Mark and Eleanor Tremblay blame vaccines for their son Ollie's autism. Come here. They just wish they'd known what to ask about the risk. Ready? We just did, you know, what parents are supposed to do, what the pediatrician tells you to do. The Tremblays are among more than 4,700 families who are suing the federal government, claiming that the mercury preservative in certain vaccines caused their children's autism. The trial, set to begin in June, is likely to have enormous implications, no matter what the outcome. Do you see yourselves as just the unlucky ones, or do you think that there's a larger issue here? Well, we're definitely the unlucky ones, <laughs> without a doubt. Um, we're not alone, though. Not alone in the search for an answer to the question, if children are soldiers in the war against infectious diseases, was their child a casualty, a victim of friendly fire?